Inside this house lives a man with an extraordinary story to tell. 48-year-old Paul Mason hasn't left his home in over two years. He's confined to his bed by his shocking obesity. The way I look at my body, um, I hate it. If you see yourself in a mirror, you think you look at another person, not yourself. It's estimated that Paul weighs close to 1,000 pounds. His life could end at any moment, but he still can't control his addiction to food. Food has absolutely devastated my life. Time is running out for Paul, unless obesity surgeon Dr. Shaw Summers can save him. Paul's body mass index is off the scale. If we leave him as he is, he will basically linger until such time that one of his organ systems gives up and he will die. But will Paul gamble his life on an operation to save it? If I was to tell you that potentially the risk may be 50-50, you might not pull through. How do you feel about that? <laughs> this is the story of the battle to save the world's fattest man. For over two years, Paul Mason has been completely bedridden. He's a prisoner of his enormous weight, a victim of his addiction to food. Food has absolutely devastated my life. It's taken my mobility away. It's taken my independence away. Living in a bed 24-7. Hate myself. Hate myself for what I've done to myself. I hate myself for not controlling it. At the height of his addiction, Paul ate non-stop throughout the day. Fry up every morning, four sausages, a whole packet of bacon, um, four eggs, two pieces of fried bread, hash browns, six pieces of bread and butter. And then half 10, 11 o'clock, I would have sausage rolls, other pastries, and then lunch would be um, fish and chips, kebab and chips, and then in the evening time, it'd be another takeaway. In a day, I would, I would eat um, 30 to 40 um, chocolate bars, three to four multi-packs of um, 24 crisps. You could look at it as same as a baby, really, wanting constant feeding, but it's not right in an adult, is it, you know? But it hasn't always been this way. Paul has lived all his life in the town of Ipswich, 100 miles northeast of London. He was an average-sized child with regular eating habits. My relationship with food when I was a child was um, we only ate what we got put in front of us. And when I look at those pictures like that, when I'm really normal size, it's most bizarre, it's like me looking at someone totally different. I never dreamt I'd end up looking like this. Here I am at um, 17 there. I was reasonably fit then. Um, as you can see, really skinny. Paul started gaining weight in his early 20s. When he was 26, things started going terribly wrong. Paul's father died and his girlfriend left him. Then he returned home to look after his sick mother. Paul started turning to food for comfort. I couldn't cope with looking after mum. That's where I went wrong. I didn't ask for help. I didn't want to ask for help because you don't want to admit that you couldn't cope. You know, and my way of, um, could say, dealing with things, dealing with my feelings was um, food. Paul gave up his job as a postal worker when his mom got sicker. And as the comfort eating increased, his weight ballooned. Without an income to pay for his food addiction, Paul resorted to desperate measures. He persuaded his mom to remortgage her house. Just focus straight on, you know, the food. You must have the food. Didn't really worry about how, you know, eventually won't have enough money to pay the mortgage and then mortgage company repossessed the house. It was a home we mum and dad worked for, and I destroyed it. <sighs> oh. 
I destroyed it with my my addiction. Paul's mom died last year. He has two sisters, but they no longer speak to him. He thinks they can't forgive him for losing the family home. Just so sorry, Judith. Oh, he was ill. Despite his feelings of guilt, Paul still can't control his addiction to food. He's now so big, he needs full-time staff to look after him, paid for by the British government. I think Paul has his ups and down days, but you can see deep down he's frustrated with the situation that he's in. Um, he tries to cut down on his food, but then sees that it doesn't help him lose the weight, and therefore makes him a little bit upset, depressed, and he gets into a bad situation where he thinks, right, I, I will have a little snack. And, um, you know, and that is what happens when you're addicted to food, really. For the two years he's been confined to his bed, Paul has tried hard to curb his diet. He struggles with his addiction every day. But when his caregivers are around, Paul eats more healthily. Whilst we're here in the daytime, all of Paul's food is monitored and controlled. He has a, a well-balanced, healthy diet. He perhaps has larger portions than the average person, but then he's a large man and he needs a certain amount of calories to keep himself going. But we try and cook in a healthy way. What goes on outside of the time that we're here, we have no control over. Paul used to have an intercom system on his front door. It allowed him to let outsiders bring extra food into the house. When you have an addiction, you will go to any lengths when things get really tough to feed it. And I would, I was letting, I was ordering takeaways, letting people in, you know. I think most of our staff struggle with the moral dilemma of the fact that we are feeding Paul. It begs the question, are we actually just you know, making him comfortable to his grave, which isn't a nice thought because that's not what, what we aim to do. Paul is completely dependent on his caregivers for his personal hygiene. He can't get to the toilet, so he has to wear incontinence pads. It's one reason why Paul is more careful about what he eats. Dealing with the toilet business when you get a beast, it's so embarrassing. You know, really, that whatever you put in your mouth is going to come out the other end. And that is an absolute nightmare. I have to use a bedpan um, and clean myself up as much as I can. Keeping Paul clean is a major operation for his team of caregivers. They wash him four times a day. Uh, these are Paul's pads that we, we have. And, um, these are Inco sheets that we put onto the bed just to stop the sheets getting wet. Um, try and keep them dry most of the time. They do work. Is that Sophie enough? Yes, thank Father you. Christmas? Yes, you want some? <laughs> it takes two caregivers almost an hour for each cleaning. Once they've washed him, they have to cream Paul's skin thoroughly to prevent it from splitting. You've got a little bit of a blister there. Whereabouts? Just on now. Is that Yeah. The urine. Yes, the urine burn. If I don't have the, um, don't have the care done, your skin will break down and then you get ill and you end up in hospital, you know? So you have to have it done. How's that feeling in there? It's not too Yeah, sore. it's not sore or anything in there, it's all right. You lose those inhibitions, you know. You can't um, think, oh, God, you know, I'm going to get embarrassed because it's your health, you know. It's part of your um, daily living, you know. You have to accept it. But Paul doesn't want to accept this kind of life any longer. He wants to lose over 500 pounds to make himself normal again. 
Weight loss surgery is now the only way to stop Paul from eating himself to death. But it's an operation that could also kill him. If I was to tell you that potentially the risk may be 50-50, you might not pull through. How do you feel about that? Paul Mason is super morbidly obese. No one knows for certain, but it's estimated he weighs well over 700 pounds. He's lost his house, his job, and his family, all because of his addiction to food. Unless he loses weight, doctors think he could die within two years. I have made myself the way I am. No one else has done it. And I tried to control it, but um, I think when you get to a certain size, it doesn't matter how much food you eat or anything, the weight just piles on. That's the hardest part I think I have to deal with, is controlling it. And I can't, I can't, not on my own. The heavier Paul gets, the more expensive it's becoming for the British government to care for him. Local health officials now believe that surgery will be a cheaper option. And they're hoping this is the man who can make it happen. Dr. Shaw Summers is one of the United Kingdom's leading bariatric surgeons. He's performed over 2,000 weight loss operations. But this is by far the biggest challenge of his career. From the records I've been given, this patient really is in a particularly bad situation with regard to the way his weight is continuing to escalate. Having said that, he seems to be young and fit enough to warrant full assessment for treatment because we could potentially reverse his problems if we could get him to the stage where we could operate on him. It just depends what we find when we see him. Dr. Summers is joined by Christine Foster from the local government-run health clinic. I've brought Mr. Summers, so we've talked... Her department will be paying for Paul's surgery. Now, may I have a look at your legs and, yep. and your tummy, just so that yep. I can have an idea? Now, clearly, your legs are quite a problem. Is that the bit that gets inflamed most? It yeah, looks like it. Yeah, the as I always get in that leg. OK, and your bits and pieces are inside, yep. under the pad there? Yeah. OK. And most of your tummy weight has gone off to the sides, and that's probably because you've been in bed for, uh, for so long. Can I just have a little feel of this side? Yeah. It does get quite that. I think that's all full of fluid. Yeah. OK. Dr Summers thinks he can perform a gastric bypass operation on Paul to make his stomach smaller and help reduce his appetite it could potentially help Paul lose over 500 pounds of excess fat. Surgery could give Paul his life back, but it comes at a huge risk. It could kill him. If I was to tell you that potentially the risk may be 50-50, you might not pull through. How do you feel about that? <laughs> the sum. That it was really getting me life back. Our job is to get you through it, mm. but I wouldn't be under any illusions that, you know, I'm taking your life in my hands and hopefully we'll be able to get you through this, but we might not. I just think if we don't, the future's yeah. fairly sealed anyway. Yeah, I know that. The choice facing Paul is bleak. Thanks. Nice to see you. Right. He has little alternative but to risk the operation. If I don't take the risk, um, my life will be short. I think diets are for people who've got to lose a food pound. And um, it doesn't work for me. I need, to, um, I need to have that facility or make my... Um, my system not capable 
of eating large amounts of food. But before the surgery can take place, they've got to get Paul to the hospital. And it won't be easy because nobody knows how much Paul actually weighs or if they can move him. It could be a new beginning, but it could also be the end of the road. Paul Mason is super morbidly obese. For the last two years, he's been stuck in bed. Hold on. Thank you. Oh. Needing round-the-clock care. Time is running out for him, but help could be on the way. 150 miles from his home on England's south coast is St. Richard's Hospital. They've treated over 4,000 morbidly obese patients. Bariatric surgeon Dr. Shaw Summers is hoping to perform a gastric bypass operation on Paul to help him lose weight. For someone in Paul's situation, it is almost impossible to lose enough weight to get out of the predicament of being bedbound. He can't mobilize, he can't burn off calories. Almost whatever he eats is going to be too much and therefore he won't lose weight. But Paul is by far the fattest patient the hospital has ever seen. And they're having to make special preparations for his arrival. First on the list is a new operating table. The one they normally use for obesity surgery will carry 980 pounds. But it's unlikely Paul will fit on it. Because of Paul's large tummy apron, we don't think our tables are going to be wide enough and that there's a danger he might roll off. So a special wider table is being delivered today and our nurses and theatre staff will be taught how to use that. But the biggest problem of all is how they're going to get Paul to the hospital. Paul's local health clinic is desperately trying to find a solution. We've got a gentleman that I need to get to Chichester who's in the super obese category. Is there a reference, a patient of reference? Christine Foster is the official in charge of organizing transport for Paul. And it's proving a difficult task. We're still in negotiations with several people, several other ambulance services and methods of trying to get Paul down to Chichester by the end of this week. The biggest problem we've got, even if we were to use a helicopter, is to getting him actually in to the helicopter. A lot of helicopters have not got wide enough entrances for the bed and him to go through safely. Can you tell me the weight limit of your, uh, for your patients going in the bariatric ambulance? 50 stone. 50 stone is equal to 700 pounds. This is the heaviest weight the ambulance service can carry. And Paul may weigh much more than that. They must be awake because um, they do have these um, lifts that um, get things off the ground. Um, so Paul is growing increasingly frustrated that they won't manage to get him to the hospital and that his operation won't go ahead. Without surgery, his future is bleak. I just had... Um, just had um, spoken to me social worker about transport, and I knew that would be a big issue. Um, apparently, the um, London ambulance service can't take me. The seeking helicopter, there's manual handling issues of getting me off the ground into the helicopter, um, and I need to speak to Christine Foster really um, because we need to think out of the box, you know. We don't, we need to go beyond the realms of health and safety and, and if it means sign, for me to sign a disclaimer to say that I will not hold them responsible if anything will happen, then I will. Paul's getting difficult in terms of the fact that he feels out of the loop, but he isn't out of the loop. It's just that I don't want to build his hopes up and then have to go back. It's a huge problem. If Paul can't get to the hospital to have his surgery, he faces certain death within the next two years. If I couldn't get down to Chichester to have this operation, it would um, finish me, I think. 
I don't think I would um, just carry on um, eating because um, that's too slow a death. <laughs> I'd probably commit suicide. <laughs> Paul has an anxious wait to see if his surgery will go ahead. It all depends on just how much he actually weighs when he's put on the scales for the very first time. Forty-eight-year-old Paul Mason has been bedridden for over two years. With his obesity spiraling out of control, he'll risk his life on an operation to save it. At St. Richard's Hospital on England's south coast, bariatric surgeon Dr. Shaw Summers plans to perform weight loss surgery on Paul. But his plans have now been hit by a serious setback. The hospital isn't certain the floors can take Paul's weight. The latest issue is that of his weight and how the hospital will carry his weight. We actually have to check with the engineers that the floor will take it. The hospital has ordered a structural survey. They need to know exactly how much Paul weighs. Currently, Paul's weight is anyone's guess. Not only is he too heavy for conventional scales, he can't stand up. A special scale capable of weighing up to 1,750 pounds has been made specifically for this task. Mike Morey has the job of getting an accurate reading. The outcome of this weigh is very, very important. Um, what it's going to do is dictate what um, transport's required to get pulled down to the hospital and what equipment's going to be required in the hospital. I'm Kelly. Hello. And I'm the back Kelly Parker works at the hospital where Paul will have his surgery. She needs to find out how difficult it will be for staff to handle a patient of his size. What I need to be able to do is to feed back to the nurses what he can do for himself, how he turns from side to side so we're able to put the relevant um, equipment in place and obviously keep the risk low so it's safety to the patient but also safety to the staff so they don't end up getting injured. They position four plates under the wheels of Paul's bed. Each plate is connected to an electronic screen which displays an accurate reading of his weight. Paul thinks he'll weigh in at 960 pounds. If I weigh less than um, the weight I think I am, um, I wouldn't say I'd be pleased, but um, I'd be a surprise. Um, but um, I don't think I will. You sure you don't want a blanket over you? It's a tricky maneuver. They need to hoist Paul up so the bed can be weighed first. It does look very large, but um, it's, um, it's difficult to tell, obviously, what sort of weight people are by looking at them. Really? Are we on? Yeah. All four plates? Yeah. Step away from the bed, make sure no one's touching anything. Mike knows how much the bed weighs. Now the scale is set up to subtract the weight of the bed from the total with Paul in the bed. Good. Now Mike converts kilograms to a figure Paul understands. The result is shocking. You're actually 56 stone 11. That's 795 pounds, 165 pounds less than Paul thought. Local health officials should now be able to move him to the hospital for surgery. Quite a shot, actually. <laughs> It's certainly good news from our point of view. Yeah, equipment-wise, equipment -wise, it means yeah, it's uh, a lot simpler to uh, mm. um, to make sure we have the appropriate equipment for you. Okay. Nice. Oh, soon be anorexic. <laughs> 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 All right. All right, Paul. Cool. Yeah. Okay. Thanks. Thank you. It's good. It's good. That's it. They're tears of happiness. <sighs> Can't wait to have it done now. <sighs> huh. 
But back at the hospital, structural engineers are still concerned. Paul's weight could place too much strain on the hospital floor. So they're installing metal supports to strengthen the floor beneath the locations where Paul's bed will rest. The ward, the operating room, intensive care, and high dependency unit. It doesn't matter too much when he's going through the corridors, that's not a problem. But when, when the bed comes to rest and the gentleman, particularly when he turns on his side, all the load goes onto two wheels of the bed. And that's a very large load on a very, very small point load. So what we're doing is making sure that the floor is not strained. Perfect, yeah, that's good. Okay. At last, the hospital has the go ahead. Paul can be admitted. And because he weighs less than originally thought, he could be taken to the hospital in a special bariatric ambulance. Right, I'm just getting my stuff ready to pack to go into hospital. But the delays so far mean the hospital is running into one of its busiest times of the year, Christmas. Paul's surgery is not an emergency case, so he'll have to wait until the new year for the operation he hopes will save his life. It's Christmas, it's gonna be really hard. The only thing what does go through my mind is um, from now onwards, every time we go to sleep at night, there's another day nearer the day. But um, yeah, things will change, start changing. So that'll be a new year, new me, new everything really, new life. There's a 50% chance Paul won't survive the surgery, but he hopes it's a risk worth taking and that it will finally end his addiction to food. Essentially what I need to do is turn his stomach from something the size of a honeydew melon to something the size of an egg. It's the day of the big move. 795-pound Paul Mason is finally being admitted to the hospital for his obesity surgery. His caregiver, Maria, will join Paul at the hospital to help the nurses look after him. He's in good spirits. I, I'm, I'm quite um, optimistic about this travel, really. He's, he's really picked up a bit. <laughs> Paramedics use an extra wide, reinforced stretcher to move Paul out of his home. Go out there, Paul. Yeah. Go as we go. Is it nice to get a bit of fresh air, Paul? Not at the moment, no. <laughs> <laughs> it's freezing, basically. <laughs> <laughs> then they use a motorized winch to maneuver him and his enormous weight into the ambulance. Right, still? Yeah. Paul hasn't been out of the house in over two years. It's really bizarre. I just can't get over the speed of the traffic. Uh, traffic to me is terrible past. I suppose for someone who goes out you know, every day, it's normal speed. Three hours later, Paul finally arrives at the hospital. Well, we're here. I'm feeling a bit stiff now. My legs, especially my legs, I feel a bit swollen. Just get in the water. Right then, Colin. Yeah. Paul's gastric bypass surgery is just a few weeks away. Yeah, okay. Okay. Big step in it, mate, eh? Yeah. <laughs> Nurses put Paul through a routine physical examination. How's your skin normally? I've got a place, you know where your buttocks? Yes. Just blow it over your thigh style. Yes. Yeah. Remind yourselves. He passes these examinations, but in the coming days, Paul will undergo more complex tests before he can receive the go-ahead for surgery. Nurses now turn Paul over to the surgical team, who are responsible for his gastric bypass operation. 
Bariatric surgeon Dr. Shaw Summers will carry out the surgery once he's sure Paul has the best chance of surviving the operation. There's a 50% chance the surgery will kill him. When I came to see you at home, we yes. just talk a bit about the risks of surgery yes. and the balance that I have to strike between putting you through something risky in order to reduce the risks of leaving you as you are. Okay. There is a possibility um, that through the surgery, things don't go according to plan mm -hmm. and something happens that could do away with you. Right. Something like a heart attack mm -hmm. or a blood. But without the gastric bypass, Paul will almost certainly eat himself to death. Essentially what I need to do is turn his stomach from something the size of a honeydew melon to something the size of an egg. Paul's surgery will unfold in two. First, Dr. Summers will staple Paul's stomach to reduce it to a small pouch. Then he'll bypass a large section of Paul's small intestine, joining the shortened intestine to the smaller stomach. Paul will not only want to eat less, but less food will be absorbed by his body. We're going to need to put Paul through a number of tests. He's going to need to see a heart specialist, a lung specialist. Once he's had all those assessments, he's going to really need my anaesthetist to have a good look at all those tests and be absolutely sure that he's safe and in the best possible condition to undergo surgery. But before surgery, Dr. Summers wants Paul to lose as much weight as possible in the hope of increasing Paul's chances for survival. So he sends his chief dietitian to strategize the best way to achieve this goal. What I need to do with you today, really, is to explore a little bit about the food issues for you. Okay. And then talk you through on our pre-op preparation, really, okay. with regards yeah. to your diet. Right. The diet we're going to use is called the milk diet. It's quite famous. And in that respect, it is just milk. So the advantage of that is there's no choice about food. You don't have to choose your portions and the source of food you're going to eat. So it makes it easy to keep too. Paul's milk diet will be under strict medical supervision. It will help him lose some weight before his operation. It will also shrink his liver, making the surgery easier for Dr. Summers to perform. Paul has lost 60 pounds. Got your jelly. Oh, lovely. Oh, we've got some different flavours. Yeah, I think that's a raspberry flavour. Paul is now allowed to mix milk in sugar free gelatin to vary the flavours and make it more palatable. Are you missing food, Paul? No. 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 It's all up here. No. If someone came in now and said, I'll give you steak and chips instead of these milk jellies, I'll say, No, thank you. No, got no cravings, nothing. I don't think he's missing food. Um, he's his opportunity and he, he won't let people down, or himself down. He will go for it. Here, eight days now. Both Paul and Maria are noticing changes to his enormous body. Things have started to decrease in size. Areas are becoming a lot less, um, what's the word, a nice word of saying, full, and they're becoming more flattened saggy, sorry. This used to be quite high here and it's looking quite flat and square really, which is one sign there. And we have a little piece just over here that used to be more erect and up, but yeah, it's now it's starting to flap. Getting all flabby and all, all around here, um, not so, I don't notice it's much, I do notice a little bit this side, but especially here where it used to be it used to be out here, um, way out here, and it's getting really loose. I can lift that right up, you know, so it's um, definitely decreasing. All good signs. The preparations for Paul's surgery are nearly complete. This is Paul, everybody. Hello. Hello. Now the nurses get up to speed. Back care advisor, Callie Parker, gives them some last minute training to help them look after Paul in intensive care. If he's unconscious or asleep after the surgery, he won't be able to help nurses care for him. They must know how to handle him. 
Can I just warn you now, it may be quite frightening at first, OK, when Paul turns... He at the moment, Paul is very, very independent, so he can actually turn himself, so the nurses don't actually have to interact too much. But with intensive care, he's going to be unconscious. It is my job to make sure that I look after the safety, not only of the patient, but of the staff as well. This is what we call the hover jack, yeah? Right. So the very same principle yeah. as if you were having to jack a car up. If Paul fell on the floor, it's very important that we've got everything in place to actually get him up safely. Excellent. That's brilliant. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Should be seasick next. <laughs> It's finally the day Paul's been waiting for. In less than an hour, he'll have the operation he hopes will eventually help him lose almost 560 pounds of excess fat. I just feel like a boy on Christmas Day gonna open the largest present he's ever had. And for me, this means everything. Okay, Paul. Yeah. It's like saying goodbye to the old Paul Mason, you know, world heaviest man. That's in the past now. But before Dr. Shaw Summers can start the operation, he's faced with a major problem. Well, no, just literally wedging it underneath. Paul is too big for the operating table. We've got the largest table that is available on the market at the moment, the Eshman. However, he's still overhanging on the right side. You've got to get a decision as to whether or not the surgeons are going to hold him on with their knees but they've got to get physically to the patient to do the operation. So we can't just put another extension on. However, you know, it is pushing um, table technology to the maximum. They've come up with a solution. They push a section of padding under Paul's overhanging stomach. Is that any different, Paul? You feel any That's different? Right. Yeah. That's comfy. Right. Yeah. Okay, we'll go with that. Yeah. Paul is now secure on the operating table. His surgery can finally begin. So big breath for me. Okay. Paul knows he only has a 50-50 chance of getting through this. Now it's down to the doctors. It's a difficult task putting Paul to sleep. He will need a larger dose of anesthetic drug than a normal sized person. Much of it will dissolve in his vast amounts of body fat. But if they give him too much, he will wake up from the surgery slower than doctors would like. Right. OK, let's just have a little look at the lie of the land. It's going to be a critical three hours. Dr. Summers has made no secret of the risks involved. He has to get it right. I'm not trying to turn Paul into a stick insect. I'm trying to stop him from dying of his current weight. Weighing 795 pounds, Paul Mason is now gambling his life on an operation to save it. Bariatric surgeon Dr. Shaw Summers is about to begin weight loss surgery on Paul. There's a 50% chance Paul won't make it through the operation. Paul is lying on the operating table fairly straight. His skeleton is straight, but unfortunately his tummy has listed towards this side, and that's because of the weight of this fatty apron with all the fluid in it has pulled his tummy over towards me. So if I take the middle of his breastbone there, his tummy button's there, and so actually the midline for Paul goes down this way. And I just have to bear that in mind when I'm planning the incisions for the operation. We're considered obese if we have a body mass index of over 30. Paul's BMI is a shocking 130, the highest Dr. Summers has ever seen. Paul's body mass index is off the scale. There are few people who survive with the kind of body mass index that Paul has. Dr. Summers hopes to perform a keyhole gastric bypass. It's less invasive and less dangerous than making a long incision in his stomach, and it will help Paul recover more quickly from his operation. Now that 
browny purple looking organ there. That's his liver. Normally it would be much more bluey purple, but you can see if I go close to it, it's quite yellowy in parts, and that's fatty liver. Absolutely typical for someone of Paul's size. It's what you'd find in a goose that was being prepared for foie gras, I'm afraid. Do you know what, Guy? I'm gonna do this keyhole. Let's take a five, thank you. Dr. Summers makes five small incisions in order to create his operating ports. He then puts the instruments through these ports and into Paul's abdomen. So the manual skills you need to do keyhole surgery are quite similar to video game skills because it's all about hand-eye coordination in 3D. There's got a few blood vessels around there, hasn't there? Dr. Summers has to proceed cautiously. As he burrows through Paul's fat, he must avoid cutting a major vein. That could cause a dangerous hemorrhage, which could only be stopped by opening him up. Just bubbles, I think. Before he staples Paul's stomach to make it smaller, Dr. Summers bypasses about one third of his small intestine. This will reduce Paul's appetite and help his body absorb fewer calories from the food he does eat. Because he's big, the temptation would be to bypass lots and lots and lots. Unfortunately, if we do that, Paul's ability to heal will be compromised. And in the long run, he may become nutritionally deficient. So we've got to be quite clear. I'm not trying to turn Paul into a stick insect, I'm trying to stop him from dying of his current weight. So I don't need to be ultra aggressive with my surgery and turn him into someone who just can't get nutrition at all. Stomach stapling is difficult to reverse, so Dr. Summers has to be absolutely accurate on the line he takes cutting across Paul's stomach. I'm cutting a pouch of stomach for Paul that's about the size of a large egg. The normal stomach is approximately the size of a honeydew melon when it's full. And my job is to give him something much smaller to work with so that he feels full more quickly and that he's just not able to eat large meals and feels satisfied for longer. And that's essentially the role of a bypass. You can see my instruments measuring it. It's about as wide as the grasper is wide. And if I take this out now, you can see that's not very wide at all, okay? So, about an egg-sized pouch. Paul now has a totally new upper digestive system. His relationship with food will never be the same again. Job done. The operation's finished now. It's all gone absolutely according to plan. Paul has his gastric bypass now, and uh, my team and I have done our work. It's really now down to Paul to make the best of it. I think I'm, I need a cup of tea. Paul may have survived a gastric bypass, but the road to recovery and weight loss is a long way off. Even if he starts losing weight, Paul will face extensive plastic surgery to regain the body he destroyed with food. It could be weeks before he leaves the hospital and months before he walks again. We'll follow Paul's physically and emotionally demanding journey in the months ahead. The lows. And the highs. I'm really, really pleased with how you're doing. Um, okay. You know, you get a big thumbs up from me. Will the world's fattest man live a normal life again? <laughs>